Yo, what is going on, everyone? My name is Nick, or The Notorious Fantasy, and today I am joined with my friend Bush over here. His Twitter is on the screen right now, and all of his links are down below in the description. Fantasy Stock Exchange, their website, draft guide, and their YouTube channel is all down there. Bush, do you have anything to say before we get into this video where we're going to be talking about our bolder or hotter type of takes for the fantasy football season. So what do you have to say here before we get into it? Uh, just honored to be on here with Nikki 4K. It's better than fucking HD, baby. Let's go. Let's fucking get it. So I'm going to go in first here. My first topic, me and Bush are both going to be talking about how we feel about each position. And I'm going to give you some stats. And so will Bush talking about each guy. So my first position here is that Dalvin Cook will not be a top 10 running back. Now, this probably sounds crazy, but it's not when you look deeper into it. So last year, Stefanski is a huge run-heavy coach. Obviously, he was not the coach of the Cleveland Browns last year. They had it, they had uh, Freddie Kitchens in there who's garbage, but uh, Stefanski runs 50.5% of the time last season. Now, according to sports injury predictor, Dalvin Cook has a 56.8% chance of getting hurt, which means pretty much he could miss at least two quarters. His projected games missed is at 1.8. And if you're looking back at his career, he's played four games in 2017, 11 in 2018, and 14 in 2019. He has yet to complete a full season healthy. And I really personally believe that Madison is so talented that I think he will be more involved. Now, I'm not saying, oh, it's going to be some type of 50-50 split. But what I'm saying is I think Madison will be getting more work since they know Dalvin Cook is so injury prone that I just feel like they have to get him in there. So I'm not saying that he's going to be terrible. I'm not saying he's going to be like running back 30. But I think there is potential for him to fall outside of the top 10. So what do you think about that, Bush? Yeah, definitely a hot take for sure. I... He's in my top six right now, but he's that guy I don't want to pick. Like, I actually, I, in my main home league, my big money league, I have the sixth pick, and I'm kind of, like, snooping around to the people ahead of me to see if someone's going to pick Dalvin Cook so I don't have to. <laughs> I, and I'm hoping, like, either Zeke or, or Kamara or Henry falls to me there because I think those guys are just much safer than uh, the Dalvin Cook is. Obviously, the injury con concerns you outlined, they, they just scare the shit out of me, to be honest. Like, when he's on the field, he's super good. But, like, yeah. like you said, Madison's a great back. He's not – anything to sneeze at and cook just can't stay healthy for a full 16 games and he'll definitely help you get to the playoffs but he might not be there for you in the playoffs when you need him most yeah 100 percent. i mean it, it is very scary i'm at like think pick seven in my 14 team league and i'm very nervous that dalvin cook will be there and i have to pick him because in a 14 team league especially if you pick him and he gets hurt your team is absolutely demolished so if you're in a bigger type of leagues i'm very nervous to draft dalvin cook and in some situations, I'd honestly much rather just draft a guy like Joe Mixon in, in situations like that, who I just feel like at least I think he'll play 16 games. I'm very worried about Dalvin Cook. I think that, like you said, when he's on the field, the guy literally could be the number one running back on the week if Christian McCaffrey somehow forgets how to score 30 points that week. But at the end of the day, I think Dalvin Cook will be good, but there is definitely potential for him to not be a top 10 guy. So what is your first hot take here? Uh, just one thing on the Christian McCaffrey thing. McCaffrey only forgets to score 30 when he plays the best run defense in the NFL, which is Tampa Bay Bucks. Anyway, um, uh, my first bold prediction is going to be that DJ Chark finishes as a top eight wide receiver on the year. So DJ Chark, I, I've, I've seen people say like, oh, he's like a breakout candidate. Well, he, bro he broke out already. Like he was yeah. already a breakout player. He only played like 13, 14 games last year because he had an ankle injury. And this team's going to be awful. Like they're going to throw the ball at an incredibly high rate. Like, the defense will force them to throw the ball. They, they lost Jalen Ramsey midseason last year. They have a rookie corner starting who, I mean, he's a good prospect, but you can't expect a rookie corner to just come in and be clamped for your secondary. Yeah. Yannick and Gawkway, who the fuck knows with that situation? They might have a rookie edge rusher on the edge too. Their, their defense has no leader. Telvin Smith is still gone. Like this, this defense is in shambles. Like they're going to be bad. <laughs> and um, DJ Chark to me, he, he literally has – uh, Minshew, uh, his quarterback, ranked in the top three on deep attempts of 20-plus yards uh, per PFF. So he knows how to get the ball downfield. And the reason he probably ranked so high is because he has DJ Chark. DJ Chark is an elite field stretcher. He's one of the best in the league at it last year. He had a 33% market share of air yards in the offense. Six, uh, 629 of his, um, of his total yards of the 1,008 yards he had on the season were air yards. He literally was getting targeted down the field constantly. He's the number one target in this offense. I expect him to have a high market share of targets. Minshew and him obviously have a connection. They showed it last year. 
And they're only, they're both young ass players. Like uh, Chark was in his second year last year. Minshew was a rookie. They're only going to grow and ascend together, which is a trend that I, I personally love to attach myself to. It's the reason I'm so high on Daniel Jones and Darius Slayton as well. Um, I expect Chark to, to be a volume hog. He, he had a, like, he didn't have that many targets last year because of the injury and the quarterback change and all that stuff. I expect him to have 140 plus targets this year uh, as his connection with Minshew grows. Yeah, no, I, I definitely think that that's possible. I mean, the wide receiver core around DJ Chark, besides the obviously the rookie they drafted in Chenault, who really is there? If you think of an average wide receiver, that's who they have. They have a bunch of those guys. So I don't know really how he can't just easily be the alpha guy on that team getting so many targets. Obviously, there's a worry that there's no London games and the Jags just light it up in London. So that is yeah. obviously something that's bad. But Blake Bortles is no longer there. He's like the king of London. They probably have a statue of him outside of the stadium. But I think that DJ Chark is going to be great. Top eight is pretty crazy. But I wouldn't be surprised if that happened, considering how good he was last year when he was healthy. Even with Minshew, who Minshew just came out of nowhere and just had to start because Foles got hurt like week one. So just imagine now Foles with a whole, or not Foles, I should say, but with Minshew with a whole offseason. I know this isn't the best offseason to really grow, but at the end of the day, he's still going to grow and he knows he needs to perform. If he does not perform, if he makes them come in dead last in the league, he won't be the starting quarterback next year, or he won't be at least probably Pretty halfway much, into the yeah. season because they'll draft Trevor Lawrence. So he has to ball out there. Obviously, he was a late-round pick in the NFL draft, but that doesn't seem to matter because once the guy's the starter, the team seems to have believed him. They didn't draft a quarterback like, oh, this guy can rival Minshew. They didn't do that. They brought in other pieces. Chenault will obviously help him, but I think that – DJ Chark as a whole is a very talented player. Where he's going, it is an extreme value, especially in redraft. I don't know why people are sleeping on him so heavily. I think he's going to be great this year. And do you have anything else to say about Mr. Chark? Yeah, um, you said they didn't bring in anyone. They didn't draft any quarterbacks. To me, it's even bigger that they didn't bring in a veteran because I thought for sure like Cam Newton, Jameis Winston, Andy Dalton, one of these guys would end up in Jacksonville, especially – now that Jay Gruden is in Jacksonville, I thought yeah. it for sure was Andy Dalton was going to be the guy that goes there. And they didn't bring in anyone. So they're obviously like Minshew starting all 16 games, unless Cam Newton's still like, cause he's still a free agent signs there. Minshew's uh -huh. starting all 16 games. And if Minshew's playing all 16 games, like I said, I expect them to throw the ball at a crazy high rate. And Chark was clearly the, the best receiver on that team last year. And Chenault's a rookie. I, I'm, I expect him to contribute, but like Gardner Minshew's best option by a mile is DJ Chark and he knows it. So I, I definitely expect a big season out of Chark if he stays yeah, healthy. For, for sure. And when your defense sucks, obviously you brought that up. Like their defense is just a bunch of guys who are just random. So they'll be good. Their, their defense will be bad, but their offense will be firing at all cylinders. So my number two take here is that Zach Ertz will not be a top 10 tight end. Now this one's also a pretty hot take considering becoming a top 10 tight end is as easy as it gets, to be honest with you. So Ertz last year finishes tight end number four. Now, after the last couple of years, Godert has been moving up there in the snap count. And my worry is that Ertz last year looked okay at the beginning of the season. He was a guy like, oh, you throw him in there. He's pretty good. You obviously can't fucking bench him because you drafted him in like the third round. But once the wide receivers started getting hurt, his value started going up. But if you think that their Eagles wide receivers can somehow stay healthy, even if just uh, Alshon Jeffrey could stay healthy or if Deshaun Jackson can stay healthy. Obviously, they brought in Rager. If all these guys are healthy, then I feel like he's going to be screwed because he won't be getting as many targets. And I just believe that he is just getting up there in age where he could potentially get hurt. He's like one injury away probably from just saying, fuck it, I'm going to go watch my wife play soccer every weekend or something instead of playing football. So I think Zach Ertz is very talented. I think he's very good for fantasy, but I just worry that what happens if everyone stays healthy because he just was not looking good at the beginning of the year. He was a guy that I was advising most people to bench at the beginning of the year, even in these like uh, great situations because the guys around him were just balling out. If you remember, I'm pretty sure Deshaun Jackson scored like 40 points week one. Maybe that was wrong. Maybe that was the year before, but no, that's a D-Jack special. He did it in Tampa too. Yeah, that, he always does that. So Zach Ertz, that, I'm just worried about that. And I'm also worried about the fact that what, if Carson Wentz dies, like he tends to do, what is Zach Ertz going to do? Probably not too much. So what do you think about Zach Ertz? And do you believe in the fact that he could potentially not be a top 10 guy? Well, I mean, they have the third best quarterback in the NFC East as their backup in Jalen Hurts. So uh, <laughs> I don't think Zach Ertz will suffer too much if Carson White gets injured. Uh, I don't know. Zach Ertz, to me, he's – to fall out of the top 10 is a bold take. It's pretty it's, – it's pretty – like the 10 – look at the 10th tight end last oh, year. It's they so were easy good. to be top 10. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty hard to fall out of the top 10. It would probably require injury to Ertz, but – 
I could definitely see him definitely falling down a tier because as you said, like the receivers there, like he's a volume guy. Like Zach Ertz is never going to be efficient. Like he just yeah. gets volume. He's, he's basically the Jarvis Landry of tight ends. So he, he he's just going to get volume. And if, if that volume is taken away from him because Rager's really good in his rookie year or Marquise Goodwin can finally stay healthy or Deshaun Jackson can finally stay healthy or Alshon Jeffrey can finally stay healthy. Like there's a lot of guys there. So, or Miles Sanders is taking like uh, is taking a lot of targets and Boston Scott's taking a lot of targets. It's, there's a lot of mouths to feed. They're all kind of unknown commodities right now, but I yeah. definitely could see two or three of them kind of um, maybe overtaking Zach Ertz because Ertz might just be relegated to it's third and seven, go to the sick, uh, go to the sticks and sit down and catch the ball. Cause like that's all Ertz is really good for anyway. So yeah, yeah I could definitely. definitely see that. Yeah. So who's your number two take here? Yeah, this one's this one's gonna piss some people off because I know a lot of people are really high on Juju Smith Schuster, but I have Deontay Johnson outscores Juju Smith Schuster in fantasy this year. Um, we're all making these excuses. We're all like, oh well, Juju didn't have his quarterback and he was banged up and like his quarterback got hit in the head with a helmet, so he probably doesn't know how to throw him the ball. Like Deontay Johnson performed regardless of that stuff. So isn't it just much more impressive that Deontay Johnson was able to perform even with all that all those factors? And we're just like kind of brushing it off for Juju as if it was some kind of like fluke year that's never going to happen again. Big Ben's injury prone. Like it could happen again. So if one of those, uh, if, if those guys, like those fucking shit quarterbacks that they have as their backups have to play again, we saw Deontay Johnson was able to perform with them. So even with Big Ben, like Ju- uh, Deontay Johnson is playing Antonio Brown's role. He's not as good as Antonio Brown. Antonio Brown's one of the best five receivers I've ever seen, but he's playing Antonio Brown's role. He played, predominantly on the outside he only played like seven percent of his snaps from the slot so he's on the outside as a rookie beating press coverage against top tier corners which is super fucking impressive he ranked number one in separation average in the nfl among all receivers as a rookie so this dude broke out again i'll say it like i said for chark from a a advanced metrics perspective he already broke out he's not he doesn't need to break out as a as a sophomore but he's only going to get better as a player Big Ben coming in meaning means the offense should be better. It shouldn't be like the dead last in red zone percentage like it was last year. And he did all this despite ranking among the 80s, like in the 80s of uh, of receivers for catchable targets, for target quality, all these like quarterback factors that Juju also had to deal with but wasn't as efficient as Deontay Johnson. So like I said, he's not AB, but he's playing the AB role. And Big Ben isn't afraid to feed a super talented receiver. We saw it with Antonio Brown. I saw a stat that was like how many of big Ben's career interceptions were him like throwing into double coverage to Antonio Brown. Like he trusts his, if he has an elite receiver, he's going to trust him. And I'm not saying Deontay Johnson's elite receiver yet, but he showed flashes in his rookie year that Antonio Brown showed in his rookie year. So Mm -hmm. he definitely is on, um, on target to become an elite receiver. So I, I, Juju, I don't think Juju's going to be bad, though. I, I think he's going to be kind of like what Jarvis Landry is. I think he's going to be a solid, like, slot guy that uh, plays super well. But I think Deontay Johnson could have, like, a breakout, breakout season, like 1,200 yards plus. Yeah, I mean, people talk about how A.B., like, oh, he can – not A.B., I should say. Big Ben, oh, he can – he only really throws to one guy, which is just untrue. I've seen that on Twitter before. He legitimately made Martavius Bryant – three, four years ago, the guy who just got caught every year smoking smoking on the loud. But he, he was a top, like, 15 guy multiple weeks. So I don't necessarily think that this is going to happen because that's kind of crazy. And I'm, yeah. I'm not a big fan of Juju. I really think that – I think he's a good player. But for fantasy, I'm just worried because Juju just, like, he fell – he just disappeared last year, even when Ben was healthy. So – I don't really know. I, I think Deontay Johnson is great. He's a guy I'm really talenting late in drafts. I'm not going to tout the fact that he's going to finish higher than Juju, but it's definitely in the, the books. It's 100% possible. And especially in these games when they're playing in their division, it seems like the most random shit could happen in those games. And those are six six games are these the most random games. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if some Bengals player just literally bashed Big Ben's skull in, like, on purpose. Or if, or if uh, Miles Garrett got to him again. I don't know. Like, I don't know. It's just crazy in that division. So, fucked, yeah. yeah, Deontay Johnson's very good. I don't think that this is going to happen, but it certainly is possible. So do you got anything else on Mr. Deontay Johnson? No, and again, I just want to repeat, like, I don't think Juju's going to be bad this year. I just don't. I, I think Deontay Johnson could be so good that he outscores him. 
Okay. Yeah, that that's definitely possible. So my third take here is this one. I say this is probably the calmest take I've had out of the first two, and that is that Josh Allen finishes higher than Deshaun Watson. Now, last year Deshaun Watson finished as quarterback number four, where Josh Allen was QB number seven, and Josh Allen played one more game than him, so obviously that is kind of worse for him, obviously, since he finished lower. Uh, last year, Josh Allen, 461 passing attempts, which is lower than Deshaun Watson's 495. 3,000 passing yards to 3,800 for Deshaun Watson. 26 passing touchdowns for Watson, only 20 for Josh Allen. They're both pretty good at the interception uh, passes. Nine INTs for Mr. Josh Allen, 12 for Deshaun Watson. And then where Josh Allen really shines, though, but – the problem here is Watson shines in this as well. The rushing category, 109 carries for Josh Allen last season, and Watson had 82. They were both over 400 rushing yards and both over seven rushing touchdowns. Allen scored nine. So the reason why I think that this is even possible is because they obviously, Watson's team, they lost their, the best piece on their team, DeAndre Hopkins. You throw the ball anywhere near him, the guy's going to catch the ball. He's got this circle around him. He'll easily catch it. Josh Allen adds Stefan Diggs. Now, I'm not saying Stefan Diggs is the second coming of Jesus or something and that he's going to make Josh Allen just that much better. But it has to be better than throwing the ball to Cole Beasley a million times a game and John Brown. I mean, I think John Brown's good. But obviously, Stefan Diggs is just that much better than him. I think that Josh Allen is, even if DeAndre Hopkins was there, I would think that's, this is possible. But the fact that DeAndre Hopkins is gone, I'm just really sold on this. I mean, DeAndre Hop, not DeAndre Hopkins, uh, Deshaun Watson's pieces around him are just, they're just injury prone, if I'm being honest with you. Cooks is going to get hurt. Will Fuller is going to get hurt. Randall Cobb will probably stay healthy. That guy's just made – He's just the only one that's going to stay healthy. I guarantee it. Yeah, he'll stay healthy. I mean, and then they have – maybe if Bill O'Brien somehow figures out how to read, hey, maybe let me dump the ball off to Duke Johnson, then maybe that'll help Deshaun Watson. Or maybe we can dump the ball off to the best wide receiver on the team, David Johnson. I don't know, but Josh Allen is going to tear it up in the rushing game. I really like his rushing upside. Ten rushing touchdowns to me does not seem impossible for Josh Allen. And now that they own this division, I mean, there's no way that they can't be scoring a lot of these points, especially in the AFC East. So I think that Josh Allen is going to be good. I think – okay, you're back. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry for over there. It's all good. I think that – since that the fact that the Bills are going to be very good in this division, the AFC East, that's obviously going to help them. They have games against, I know, some people in the Cobbs will think, oh, the Jets' defense is good. It doesn't fucking matter. The Bills will beat them. They could beat the Dolphins. They could beat the Patriots. And I think that Josh Allen is just so talented. And the fact that I worry about the Houston Texans situation as a whole, because that the Houston Texans division is probably the most confusing one to figure out who's going to win it. I wouldn't be surprised if the Texans won it or if the Colts won it. So I think that Houston will be fine, but I just think that Josh Allen has an even better year than he had last year, and last year was by far his best season. So what do you think about Josh Allen finishing higher than Deshaun Watson? Yeah, I'm definitely going to disagree with this one. I think the Texans' defense is so bad, so bad. Like, it's terrible. It's J.J. Watt and a bunch of slappies out there. Like, there is no one good in their back end except for Justin Reed. Their corners are shit to the point that they signed Vernon Hargraves to start on the team. Like, they are awful in the secondary. I think Deshaun Watson is throwing the ball 600-plus times minimum this year. I Like, I'm going to have him strictly because, one, he's one of the best quarterbacks in the league, and, two, he's going to get elite volume. I honestly don't even care whose receivers are. Deshaun Watson's going to be elite this year just for fantasy because he's going to be forced to, into situations where he's got to be Superman and do what he did at Clemson. So I think Josh Allen's going to have an incredible year, but I'm going to I'm going to disagree with this one because I think Deshaun Watson's volume is going to be outrageous. And Josh Allen does ha has an elite defense, like elite defense. So he's not going to have to be put into those situations where he's got to carry the carry the load. And not to mention Watson's not going to have a run game either. So yeah, I mean I have them back to back in my rankings. I think I have Allen at five. Watson at six. So they're probably going to finish right next to each other to me if they both play 16 games. I just really believe in Josh Allen. I just think that the Bills are going to be so good this year and that if Allen isn't, I'd be pretty surprised. So you got anything else to say on this or should we move to you? I have next? Watson in my top three in my rankings. Oh, I have crazy. him third. So ahead of Prescott and, and Murray, which is a, like a very hot take. But I, I, I think, like I said, I think his volume is going to be outrageous. Oh, okay. I, I can see that. So what is your third take here? All right, my third take, this is my hottest one for sure. Um, <laughs> Ronald Jones is an RB1. Jesus, that, That's my take. That, that's a hot take. Um, okay, so 93% of the time, uh, a running back who saw 250-plus carries and six-plus touchdowns was a top 15 RB. 
this is going to be an elite offense. I, I know some people, Patriots fans probably don't want it to be an elite offense, <laughs> but this offense is going to be elite. Ronald Jones is going to get the lion's share of the carries because Keyshawn Vaughn is just not as good as Ronald Jones. It's just it's plain and simple. He's just not as good as him, especially as a runner. And the goal line work, especially Ronald Jones was one of the most efficient goal line backs in the league last year. He averaged like two broken tackles per carry on the goal line, which is crazy. So, uh, Ronald Jones is going to see this volume. He, Bruce Arians he does not trust rookies. He's one of those coaches that like, if you remember Joe Mixon's rookie year, like we were like, why isn't Marvin Lewis using Joe Mixon? He's clearly better than what they have there. Bruce Arians, one of his flaws is that he doesn't really trust rookies, especially rookie running backs. So I could definitely see Keyshawn Vaughn getting a lot less work than some people are anticipating. And by some people, I mean the people that are taking Keyshawn Vaughn over Ronald Jones in redraft, not in dynasty in redraft. People are picking Keyshawn Vaughn over Ronald Jones, which is insane to me. Um, he, Ronald Jones, as a player, also made major improvements last year. I follow his trainer on Twitter. He's constantly doing stuff. And I know it's not like – I'm, like, not impressed that he's fucking running routes against air and he looks good doing it. I'm impressed that he's always putting in work. It's always – like, every day he's doing stuff. So that's the part that impresses me, not necessarily what he's doing. It's how often he's doing it. And remember how garbage he looked as a rookie? Like, he was terrible. And part of it was Dirk Cutter's scheme because he doesn't know how to fucking run a running a rushing offense to save his life. But another part of it was Ronald Jones's like maturity and he just didn't look like he didn't know how to be a professional yet. So he put in the work last year and he got better, like astronomically better. Like he was PFF's number one graded running back through nine weeks of the NFL season last year. He was better as a receiver, which he was never good at in college. So he, he was never a good receiver in college. He was much better as a runner. He was more instinctive. He was more decisive. He wasn't dancing behind the line of scrimmage like he did his rookie year. And he was better in pass protection his second year, but he still wasn't good enough um, for Bruce Arians' offense. And basically what it came down to was mental mistakes. Like he, he would have a blitz pickup and he would just go to the wrong thing. Like he just didn't know the scheme well enough, in my opinion. So familiarity in the system, it's a second year in Bruce Arians' system. I think it's still going to be Bruce Arians' system. I don't think it's going to be Tom Brady's system that you teach to fucking – 50 new or 20 new guys on offense. It's the greatest quarterback and probably the smartest quarterback of all time. I think he can learn a new system just fine. And he's a better runner than Vaughn. As I said, he's a better receiver than Vaughn, as I said, and he can, he can become better in pass protection. Like I said, I follow his trainer on Twitter. He's working on it. I expect him to get better at pass protection so he can stay on the field. I think he's in line for a 1200 yard rushing season. I think he's going to be incredible and as and the offense is so good that it wouldn't shock me if he has like an Aaron Jones type breakout where he just has a shit ton of touchdowns yeah I mean I yeah that's what the, my thing is if he was to become an RB1 he just barrels into the end zone like 15 yeah. times because they're just scoring so much. that's the only way I see it's possible I don't think that Ronald Jones is bad I'm not saying that he's shit but I'm just worried about the fact like what if Dare Agabaduge gets that's not obviously how you say his name you're a Tampa Bay Bucks fan but I don't what if he's getting more touches than we think what if other people are seeing the dump offs. I mean, I know Peyton Barber's gone and Peyton Barber was not very good, but I'm just worried about the fact, like what happens if they're actually just passing the ball more than we think they will? Like what if Tom Brady, they just give him, I know you said that you don't think this will be Tom Brady's offense, but what if Bruce Aarons is just like, fuck it, throw the ball 580 times, throw it 600 times, do what Bill Belichick wouldn't let you do. So maybe that happens. And maybe they're just such a pass heavy attack that Ronald Jones doesn't get a lot of touches. Now I think top 20 running back, top 25 running back is possible for Ronald Jones. He will probably have 25 running back last year with Peyton Barber there. Yeah, no, he could be a running back, like running back number five on certain weeks. But I'm just worried when the season comes to an end that maybe Keyshawn Vaughn gets more work as we get later into the season. Now, I know you bring up the thing about how in all or nothing, David Johnson, they said, oh, he'll be the starter by Thanksgiving. I think that's what he said. But what happens if by like maybe week eight, maybe they're splitting more than you maybe thought? What if it's 50-50 or not really 50-50, but 50-50 between them? then you're fucked with Ronald Jones because maybe Vaughn is getting more dump offs. He's getting more of this, more of that. So I just think that Ronald Jones will be fine. I'm just not going to pretend to think myself that he could be top 12 where I know you definitely believe it. Yeah. I, to, to go as far the, the pass heavy thing, I don't think this team is going to be very pass heavy at all. I think this, I think we have an elite defense. Like I think our defense is going to be they, uh, PF or not PFF ESPN came out with their power index or whatever. And they had Tampa Bay as the number five ranked defense, or sorry, number four, ahead of the Niners, ahead of like, like elite defense. Like they had an elite defense last year. Like I said, they were number one rushing defense in the NFL the whole year. Mm -hmm. And their past defense was like top 10 towards the end of the year. 
their defense is going to be elite. I, I like, I think the offense is going to have to rely on the rushing attempts more. And they weren't even like, unlike some teams that like are behind all the time, they still kind of stuck to the run. They didn't abandon it even last year when they were turning the ball over at a super high clip. So I think there's enough rushing volume for Ronald Jones to get like 250 carries and Keyshawn Vaughn to still get like 160, 180 carries. And then, I mean, the, the receiving work, it, it was never going to be like, Ronald Jones was never going to be a 50 catch guy. Like I think uh, Ogun Bawale is still going to be involved in that aspect, especially if Ronald Jones continues to struggle in pass protection, which I don't think he will. But if that happens, Ogun Bawale is the best pass protector on the team. They'll probably just use him on third downs, even though it tells the fucking defense everything that you're going to do. Um, I, I think this is very possible. 250 plus carries. He had 190 last year. Like he, Peyton Barber left behind like 200 carries. Like I, I'm pretty sure there's enough for both guys to get a solid workload. And the reason I'm not really going to be drafting Tom Brady this year is because I, I think they're only going to have to throw the ball like 525 times, which they threw it like 615 last year. So, yeah. But I mean, they also had the best quarterback of all time last year. And yes. so they got the second yes. best now. So I, I don't know. I'm just never going to believe in Ronald Jones. I'm just not someone who's going to believe in him. I'm not the fantasy counselor. So I'm going to go ahead and not believe in him, but I think he'll be fine. So my next take here, we're at four takes deep right now. So if you guys have enjoyed the video thus far, please click that subscribe button. And when you're down there, check out Bush as well. So my fourth take here is that Hayden Hurst is a top six tight end. This one, I, I honestly believe like 100% this is going to happen as long as he doesn't get hurt. Atlanta has 111 vacated targets to the tight end position as well as 68 to the wide receiver position. Now, last year, Austin Hooper in just 13 games was tight end number six. So if Hurst could play more games than that, I think it's a lock. 97 targets, which is 7.5 per game. Dirk Cutter legitimately jerks off to looking at the tight ends on his roster. He just does it. He does the thing in the league where Ruxin's just jerking off to the board. That's what he does every single night. He loves the tight end position. He doesn't know how to use running backs, but he knows how to use those tight ends. 97 Amen. targets, like I said. 75 receptions, 5.8 per game. 787 receiving yards, six total touchdowns, and they were number one in pass plays per game last season. Now, I'm not saying that's 100% going to happen happen but when your defense isn't very good like the Falcons you pretty much have to pass the ball and when you're in a division that is so pat like in games where they're going to be high scoring like even against the Bucks that have a good defense you know the Falcons are going to find a way to score a couple times yeah. in that game so I just think that Hayden Hurst is going to be very good this year I think Hayden Hurst while he might not be as good as Austin Hooper they traded a lot for him they traded a second round pick to acquire him as well as a fifth round pick I believe and I just think that Hayden Hurst is just so talented and it wouldn't matter, like, if this was just some random guy, like some, like, you know, the Falcons, they used to have a guy's name was like Tolo Lolo Lolo. If he was the fucking tight end, probably not going to be top six. But Hayden Hurst is definitely good. They dra The Ravens drafted him highly, and they got some good picks for him. So I think that Hayden Hurst is going to be great this year. I think, to me, he's my favorite late-round tight end pick by far. I think he's yeah. going to really fly up in the ADP, and I'd still happily take him in, like, the eighth round if that's where he's going because I just think he's going to be that good. So what do you think about Mr. Hayden Hurst? Yeah, I mean, like, if you didn't take this one, I was going to. Like, hey, here's a general rule. For anyone who's, like, new to fantasy or doesn't, like, understand coaching change, like, coaching is a huge deal. And yeah. Dirk Cutter, you want every part of his passing game. You want absolutely nothing to do with his rushing game. Todd Gurley's going to suck this year. You can book that, put it in ink. Like, he is going to suck this year. I saw it in Tampa. Devontae Freeman's rookie year, he was terrible. Fucking Ronald Jones' rookie year. Like, Dirk Cutter can't establish the run to save his life. But – he loves the tight ends. Look at OJ Howard in 2018. Look at Cameron Brayton in 2016. Like, he loves tight ends. Look at Austin Hooper last year. No one was saying Austin Hooper was going to be an elite tight end last year. Before mm -hmm. he went down, he was a tight end one. Like, he was, he was the best tight end in fantasy before he went down. Dirk Cutter is going to feed Hayden Hurst. Hayden Hurst is more talented than Austin Hooper. Anyone who tells you that is – or anyone who tells you otherwise is lying and they're just going on <laughs> recency bias. Like, Hayden Hurst was a first-round pick ahead of Lamar Jackson. He was a talented – uh, prospect coming out. He was an older prospect, but he was still talented. Hayden Hurst, to me, he's like, this isn't even a hot take. Like, I expect this to happen. He is my number six tight end. Yeah, I think he's number five for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, th I think it's 100% going to happen. This is like the, the easiest call to me, but some people prefer to take other guys later in the draft that they think have this type of potential. So I think that saying Hurst can do it is kind of a hot take. So what is your number four take here? Uh, yeah, to me, sir, well, one more thing. There's more oh, concerns with other guys ahead of him. Like Darren Waller has a lot of new uh, options in his offense and a Hunter Henry has a new quarterback. Like, I, like those guys, to me, I'd rather take uh, Hayden Hurst over them, especially if I'm getting a discount on ADP. 
Yeah, one hundred percent. And then there's other guys ahead of him, like Hunter Henry. That guy just always somehow gets hurt. So like, I yeah, exactly. it hurts. We don't know. Like, I don't think he's that injury prone of a guy. It doesn't seem like it. Yeah, no. Okay, so speaking of the Raiders, I brought up Darren Waller. Um, uh, my my next hot take is that Josh Jacobs will lead the NFL in rushing and rushing touchdowns. So basically, what I'm saying is Josh Jacobs is going to be like a top like three running back in fantasy. So. Jacobs last year had 240 carries in 13 games. He was on pace for 300 plus carries, 300. He runs behind a top five uh, run blocking offensive line in the league that, I mean, unless they do trade Gabe Jackson, which I know there were some rumors about that should be all back and healthy. They also drafted some depth uh, to develop behind incognito. Who's getting older and all that stuff. Uh, the scheme that they play in features a workhorse runner. I wa- I'm a Tampa Bay Bucks fan. I watched John Gruden run Cadillac Williams into the ground. <laughs> They drafted him in 2005 ahead of Aaron fucking Rodgers and ran him into the ground. They gave him 290 plus carries his rookie year in 14 games. The next year, Cadillac Williams had only 25 targets his rookie year. He had 44 in 14 games his second year. So I expect Josh Jacobs to get a little bit of a bump in the target uh, column. I don't think he's going to be a 50 catch guy, but I think he's going to be kind of where Joe Mixon is right now. People assume Joe Mixon's an elite pass catcher and he is but he doesn't get the target volume an elite pass catching running back would get. I expect Josh Jacobs to get, I don't know, 35, 40 catches next year, which is enough with his rushing volume and the goal line. He has a monopoly on his goal line. Like he is the only goal line runner on his team. They will not give a single fucking carry to another runner uh, on the goal line other than Josh Jacobs. To me, he's a lock for like eight plus touchdowns. And if, if you expect the offense to be better, which I do, I think Henry Ruggs is an elite receiver. I think, Darren Waller is an elite tight end. I think Josh Jacobs is an elite running back. You have a, uh, a playmaker, uh, um, a point guard type quarterback in Derek Carr, who, who's a smart quarterback. He knows where to get the football. I think this offense could be a top 15 offense in the league. So to me, like Josh Jacobs, like, from a talent perspective, he's the only running back since 2006, which is the start of the PFF era, to post 200 plus carries and a PFF elusive rating above 100. He had the best elusiveness rating of all time as a rookie. He averaged 3.5 yards per carry after contact. 3.5 yards per carry was almost as much as David Montgomery and Sony Michelle averaged per carry, not like after contact. That's tough. Um, his He's in line to see a modest increase in passing work. As I said, Cadillac Williams uh, was eased in his rookie year and Mike Mayock and John Gruden have referenced this. They've said, oh, Josh Jacobs like was eased in his rookie year. They, they, eased in you gave him like 300 plus carries like a pace of 300 plus carries <laughs> to me eased in means that he's going to get more passing work uh, i know they added lynn bowden i know they uh, they retained jalen richard and stuff those guys will still be involved but to me jacobs is going to have more designed like receiving plays which means he's gonna like he's gonna have a little bit of receiving floor i, I still expect him to be a main like a mainstay as far as like he's going to get 300 plus carries but as I said, he has a monopoly on his, on his goal line. Like, he is going to, like, probably get 8 to 12 touchdowns guaranteed. And if he gets, like, again, like I said for uh, Ronald Jones, I could see him having an Aaron Jones-type season where he just has, like, like an insanely high touchdown rate. And next year at this time, we're like, Josh Jacobs isn't going to have that many touchdowns again. But, I, like, I expect him to be elite. Like, I, he's my number seven running back right now behind Alvin Cook. Yeah, I think he's going to be great as well. I think I have him inside the top 12. I flip-flop him and Austin Eckler all the time. Like, I love Eckler. I love Jacobs. It's very confusing for me. But at the end of the day, Josh Jacobs is going to be fucking great. Like, when they added Henry Ruggs, this makes the offense just so much better. They have a guy that can stretch the field, a guy who's fast as fuck. You can do all these play-action type of plays. Or you can just hand the ball off to Josh Jacobs. And he's he just going to stretch gonna- the field horizontally, too. Henry yeah. Ruggs was used at, at Alabama. He was used a lot on, like, sweeps and – um screen passes bubble screens like all that stuff rugs is unreal at that and i expect him to use them in that fashion anyone who thinks they drafted a fucking deep threat at number 12 overall is insane anyone who thinks brian edwards who's a nice addition who will help the offense is going to see more targets than rugs is insane but rugs like tyree kills and john ross are the only two receivers in the league that boast the speed that rugs boast defense is gonna be scared shitless of henry rugs like they're going to be scared shitless of henry rugs like Especially if, like, what I expect to happen, they play Carolina week one. Okay. I, I wouldn't shock me if – remember Hollywood Brown's rookie year last year, his week one performance against Miami? I could I see remember. Ruggs doing the exact same thing. Yeah, no, I, I could see that as well. I mean, 
Josh Jacobs is so fucking good. Like, it's crazy. Like, the guy last year, everyone – some people, like, were discrediting, oh, the guy's too big. Like, the guy literally looks like thick – he's thick with 12 Cs. That's how big the guy is. But it, it didn't seem to matter at all. As, if he doesn't get hurt, he could be – I mean, it's so hard to be the number one guy in fantasy. I know you talked about, like, you're talking about, like, being the NFL leading rusher. It's hard to pass Christian McCaffrey like, or Saquon. Like, if yeah. none of those guys get hurt, there's no way anyone's passing him. But at the end of the day, Josh Jacobs is very good. I could see him being the rushing leader. My only worry in this is what if they just legitimately take Derrick Henry and just stomp that they, they put it, his mouth to the curb and they just curb stomp him till he dies on this offense. They just give him the ball 400 times because that's how you win the game in Tennessee. That worries me. I mean, Nick Chubb was pretty much going to be the rushing leader until they kind of slowed him down week 17. And then Henry just probably, he probably ran for like 400 yards in that game. It was unreal. Yeah. Those I, two guys are definitely like probably the and probably Zeke Elliott too are those those guys are probably the biggest threat to like the rushing crown if I were to say it for Jacobs but I mean like I said I think Jacobs could have an uber efficient season like the the line that he has the the offense he's in the the scheme he's in it's all in favor of him the weapons that he has on the outside they all help him yeah the whole offense is going to run through Josh Jacobs I love Rugs and I love Waller and stuff but the offense is Josh Jacobs and He's gonna the, the team's gonna go as far as he takes it. And I think this team could be like a sneaky playoff team. Yeah, I, I just really hope that car doesn't get hurt because if it's fucking Mariota, I would run clear away from everyone. Yeah, on no, the if Mariota's the head of the offense, that's 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 GG. Yeah, for sure. I, I think that this take is one hundred percent possible. I'm not saying it's gonna happen, but I think it's possible. So my final take here, unless you have anything else about Mr. Jacobs, is that I think this is the Detroit Lions offense. I'm going to pick three guys from there. So I got Mr. Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, and TJ Hawkengod combined for more points than Jarvis Landry, Odell, and Austin Hooper. Now, some people might think this is crazy. They're, everyone was huge fans of the Browns last year. Now everyone's hating on the Browns. So maybe they just somehow come back and they're just great. But Cleveland brings in Stefanski. I talked about this earlier. He was the head coach of Minnesota in 2019. They ran the third highest amount in the NFL at 50.5%. I wouldn't be surprised with the one-two punch they have there. I know people are trying to say, oh, Kareem Hunt's only the dump-off guy, blah, blah, blah. No, he, he was literally one of the best running backs in the league before he did what he did. So, I mean, if he was on the Chiefs right now, you'd be talking about him being a top-five running back. But Austin Hooper obviously comes in here. So for this part of the, the thing where I think that Galladay, Jones, Hawkinson are going to be better, Austin Hooper still has competition. Njoku is still there. Njoku is not going to just completely disappear. Landry comes into the season. He's hurt. Well, he's not necessarily hurt. He had surgery. So he could still be a bit banged up. And in an offseason like this, you don't know how much he's getting physical treatment and all that kind of stuff. So I just think it is 100% possible that – Though these guys fall down. Stafford last year was having an MVP-like season. He was playing the best Matthew Stafford has ever played. Now, there's obviously worried that this guy, his back is just fucked. His back is just shot. Two years in a row, he hurts his back. Now, I understand he played 16 games the year before because the guy's just an alpha, but he was going out there with his crutches on, throwing the ball like week 15 of 2018. Now, Marvin Jones last year was wide receiver number 28 in just 12 games, and Kenny Galladay was wide receiver number 9 in 16 games. Landry was wide receiver 12 in 16 games, and Odell was wide receiver 25. So if you're looking at it, it was kind of close. They both finished around near each other. So if Marvin Jones somehow doesn't, he always gets hurt. This guy is probably slated to play, I'd say, 14 games. I don't think he plays 16. But if he plays 14 games and Landry's kind of banged up, and this offense is running the ball as highly as possible, these two wide receivers either easily beat out those two. And then it's pretty much a crap shoot between Hooper and Hawkinson to me. I think Hawkinson's really talented. My worry though is there's kind of there's a bunch of players around Hawkinson. Danny Amendola is still there. Geronimo Allison, I believe, is now there. So there's other guys that could be taken touches. I'm not saying Geronimo Allison's great like I probably told you last year, because that guy fucking sucked. So no need to talk about him. But I just think that this is 100 percent possible. So do you think it's possible for Kenny Galladay, Marvin Jones, and Hawkinson to outscore Landry, Odell, and Hooper? I want absolutely nothing to do with Odell Beckham Jr. this year. Like I abs- like nothing to do with him. I believe in Baker Mayfield. He was like you saw on my on the show sheet. I had Baker Mayfield's a top five QB as one of my takes initially. Mm-hmm. Man, this fucking offense scares the shit out of me, though. Like, I, like I, I, I love Baker. He was my number one quarterback in that draft. That's the reason I like Baker so much. I think I love his personality. I love his brash, like, nature. So I don't I. want him to become, like – Jameis Winston was like Baker when he came into the league, and then the league kind of kicked the shit out of him, and he kind of became, like, quiet. And, like, I don't want Baker to lose that. I want Baker to always be like that because I think that's when he's best. But yeah. – this is totally possible. Like I had Matt Stafford and Kenny Galladay in uh, in one of my leagues last year as like a stack, 
and oh, they God, were tier. fucking unreal last year. Like they were. Th- Odell Beckham never had any games like that. Like he had that one game against the Jets where he caught like a 75 yard touchdown. But other than that, he was never consistent. You never wanted to start Odell Beckham. Uh, Odell Beckham last year. Jarvis Landry is no. Jarvis Landry. He's always going to be fine. And Austin Hooper is like, I guess, kind of interesting. But like they have two tight ends there. Uh, TJ Hawkinson to me is like the part of this that like I'm not really buying. Like I liked Hawkinson as a prospect, but I didn't really see a lot from him last year aside from that first game against the Cardinals where they ran, like, 7 million plays. Yeah, but against the fucking Cardinals, literally any team had, like, a top tight end. Well, yeah, they have edge rushers covering fucking tight ends on that team, so. Yeah, I mean, I just didn't think the take would be hot enough to just include Galladay and Jones versus Landry. Yeah, you got to include Hawkinson, yeah, because I actually, like, I would expect that to be. Galladay and Jones and Stafford to outscore the three of the the Browns guys. Did you include the quarterbacks or no? No, but because I thought that would also make it too easy, to be honest with you. Yeah, okay, all right. So Stafford, yeah, like you said, when you were talking, I actually just thought of this. What if Cam Newton ends up on this team? Oh, that'd be good for that. I could see, I could totally see that. Because, like, what if uh, we go into the season and we start hearing shit like Stafford's back still isn't great or, like, whatever? I could see Cam Newton being the quarterback of this team, like, at some point this season, whether Stafford goes down or they just want insurance on Stafford in case he goes down. Yeah. Um, Either way, I, I think this is a pretty pretty valid take. And to me, like the Browns, the Browns guys, I'm not really avoiding any of them other than Odell. Like I think Jarvis Landry's fine where he's going. I think Hooper's fine where he's going. I think Baker's fine where he's going. I, I just think Odell to me has so much name value, especially if you play in any kind of like home league where people don't listen to fantasy advice or whatever, that they're going to take Odell higher than he's going because he's Odell Beckham. Yeah, I mean, I live in New Jersey. The, these guys will literally suck Odell off. Like, they love the guy. But yeah. uh, I just think, like, Galladay and Jones last year did it. I mean, Galladay, half his games were with David Blau, okay? He did it with David Blau. So, just imagine, I don't think Cam Newton is the greatest quarterback of all time. I don't think he's the best player of all time. I don't think he's that good. I don't even think he's better than Stafford. I think Stafford's better than him. Oh, but yeah, even if sure. he became the quarterback, they'd both be fine. Like, I, it doesn't matter who the quarterback is. You could legitimately put you or me as the quarterback. I mean, they'd probably be shit, but come on. Better like, than David Blau. David Blau? Who the fuck is – like, no, I had no idea who he was until he stepped onto the NFL field. Like, they wanted to bring in an XFL quarterback, and they denied that happening because no one had any idea who David Blau was. So I was, I think at, this... the, I was at the game, uh, Tampa and Detroit, in week 15, and the, the, the Lions only had, like, five yards of offense in, like, the third quarter of the game. Like, my, my one buddy was chirping the Lions fans behind us, and they were, like, so okay with it. They're like, we're going to get a top three pick. It's fine. Because <laughs> yeah, David I... Blau was just so garbage that they, like, couldn't even handle him. Yeah, and the Lions' defense isn't that good either. Like, I mean, obviously, no. they draft guys, some good guys. They lose Slay. Obviously, Slay just – that guy fucking hated. I think he just hates Matt Patricia and that pencil. He wanted to take the pencil off of him and shove it up that guy's ass. He hates him. But I think this take is 100% going to happen. This, this, this take and the Hayden Hurst one, I am 100% confident in. I think that these easily will happen. So, do you got anything else on this, or do you want to move to your fifth take, which is kind of crazy? Yeah, I'm going to go to my fifth take. And I'm actually going to kind of go dual takes here because I already touched on this with DJ Chark, but I think Minshew finishes as a top 10 quarterback. And the reason I think this is I mentioned Jameis Winston already. Minshew to me is going to be this year's Jameis Winston where he throws the ball so fucking much. He probably turns the ball over at a decent clip too that he, he's basically just a volume hog. Like I expect this offense to shift away from Leonard Fournette because they realize his inefficient ass isn't carrying them to anything. <laughs> yeah. And – Minshew is no stranger to throwing the ball a lot. Like he played at fucking Washington state, like (laughs) under Mike Leach, he knows how to throw the ball 40 times a game. And like I said, with Chark, the Jags defense is going to be awful. They're going to be playing catch up the whole time. Minshew is, it was great on deep attempts. He's going to be chucking the ball downfield. They have a bunch of explosive athletes at the receiver position, whether we think DD Westbrook and Chris Conley are good players or not. They're, they're great athletes. They're going to be great run after the catch guys. As I mentioned with DJ Chark, LaVisca Chenault coming in like these guys can take it 75 plus yards any day of the week. So I think Minshew is going to get padded by his receivers in the skill sets that they have. And he's also going to throw the ball 600 plus times a game. As I mentioned for Deshaun Watson, like volume is king for quarterbacks, like quarterbacks that throw the ball that much. It's very hard not to be like a top 10, top five guy. You basically just have to be awful to do that. And I saw enough from Minshew as a rookie to say that if he threw the ball that much, he would actually be good. Like he wouldn't just be like a volume guy. He'd probably be like somewhat efficient. He'd probably turn the ball over a little bit, but he'd probably be decent. I just want to throw in a little quick bonus one just because um, we talked about it on our, our breakout show. I think Brashad Perryman could finish as a top 15 receiver. 
That's so crazy. I know, I know, it is crazy. But I think Brashad Perryman is more talented than Robbie Anderson, and he could be what we wanted Robbie Anderson to be in the Jets' offense. And he was a league winner last year. Like, he was the most common player on fantasy championship rosters because Chris Godwin went down and Mike Evans went down. Like, there's no Chris Godwin or Mike Evans on the Jets right now. And Sam Darnold is a D gaffer type of quarterback, meaning he'll chuck it up to his receivers. He did it at USC with Juju. He did it at USC with, uh, with DD Westbrook. Like he, um, he will chuck it to his receivers and I could see Brashad Perryman like legitimately looked good last year. He could have a Devonte Parker like season this year. Yeah. But when the, the, the worry though is well, Crowder's still going to get the ball, like thrown to him 10 fucking times. And, and the he problem probably is- will, he probably will. Yeah, the, the problem, though, is that the, I don't think Brashad Perryman's a bad player. He was good last year, but Adam Gaze is a fucking idiot. Like, that's, that really worries me. Adam Gaze is a dumbass. This so, defense could be bad, too. I, like, Jamal Adams is probably going to get traded before the season started. Like, yeah, I, no, I legitimately I think that's going to happen. If Jamal Adams is gone, this dude, they have no corners and no edge rushers. Like, their defense could be shit. Like, Darnold could be throwing, like, slinging the ball. Like, Adam Gaze is probably going to get fired in week four. And I could see Brashad Perryman having like a stretch that he had last year where he just balls out with Sam Darnold. Maybe that takes him a bit of time and they, they catch up and they finally get some chemistry. But I, it wouldn't shock me if Brashad Perryman's on a one-year deal, gets extended midseason because he's so fucking good with Sam Darnold. Yeah, no, that wouldn't surprise me either. I mean, on the Jets' defense being bad, like that's 100% possible because Jamal Adams, he's being linked to the Cowboys. And now while I don't know if that's possible or not, if that does happen, if he gets traded, their defense fucking sucks. But mm-hmm. I think that I made a take in another video that was like, oh, Matt Breed is going to run a train on the Jets. And like the Jets defense just isn't that good. And someone had a dispute in the comments. We talked about it, but it's 100% possible. But going back to your Gardner Minshew take, the problem with the take is that why our quarterback seven through 12, I feel like could be a mix and match of like 20 guys. Like, we're talking about, like, if Stafford stays healthy, Stafford could easily be top 10. Stafford, Matt Derek Ryan. Derek Carr could be top 10, for fuck's sake. Yeah. Like the quarterback like, position is so deep. Like, Daniel Jones uh, could be there, which I believe he could be. And then there's guys like Tannehill. Tannehill, while he might regress, was fucking on fire. There's so many guys that could fit into this spot. Like, even if Fitzmagic played the whole season, which I would not be surprised if he was somehow top 12 because of just how No, how I wouldn't crazy either because they're going to throw the ball like a crazy amount again. Yeah, and then obviously Joe Burrow, he's a rookie, so there's not as high of a chance, but that's also possible. There's like 10 guys that could e- – there are 20 guys that could easily be the top 10 guy, and then you get into the like 20-plus where it's just like Dwayne Haskins or these other fucking Teddy scrubs. Water and shit, yeah. Yeah, who you just don't think could do it, but that's my only worry with it. I think Minshew is going to be great this year, and I think he doesn't even get drafted. In like all these mock drafts I do, he never gets drafted, and if he does get drafted, it's like that random pick where someone drafts a defense in the 12th round. So then they pick Gardner Minshew in the last round. So I think Minshew will be good. I'm not going to say he's going to be top 10, but I think top – he will definitely have like probably five, six weeks this season where he is like the number three guy. For sure. I um, In a lot of best ball drafts, what I've been doing is because the quarterback position is so deep, what I've been doing is I've been like waiting so fucking long for quarterbacks and I've been getting like Minshew, Derek Carr, and like Drew Locke as my three quarterbacks in a best ball draft. And my team's just absolutely loaded to the brims at the rest of the positions. And those three guys, like, it wouldn't shock me if all three of them were top 15 options next year. Like, Locke, Carr, and Minshew. Yeah, just make sure you don't start fucking Minshew against the Titans because the Titans are just going to ram them down. Yeah, he played really bad against Houston, too, that one game, too. Yeah, I think that was in London, though, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. He got he threw, like, a bunch of picks, and they benched him for Foles. And then the Bucs defense shit-pumped Nick Foles, and then they put him back in. Yeah, I mean, Foles, Foles that's, that guy's a whole different animal. I could see him being, like, so shit this year, but I could also I, see him, I like, think the Bears might the Bears. have the number one pick. <laughs> like, I, I think the Bears could be awful. Like, like absolutely awful. I expect them to draft the quarterback next year. Yeah, well, you would hope they would because fucking Trubisky's a bum, so. Yeah, like, if they think Nick Foles is carrying them anywhere that's not, like, to the top ten of the draft, like, they're, they're insane. The, the problem, mean, though, not, is Alfia, which means he's not going to be good. Yeah, but their defense is just so good. Like, what? Like, you don't need that good of a quarterback. They lost their you... best corner. Yeah, I know, but tr- – oh, the shout-out to the Cowboys losing their best corner, but they're still a good defense, yeah. you know what I'm I, I don't think the Bears' defense is going to be that good. I think it's going to be, like, a top 15 defense. Like, Roquan mm-hmm. Smith hasn't really been the player that people expected him to be coming out of school. I thought he was going to be a superstar linebacker, and he hasn't really been that. He's been a good player, but he hasn't been, like, elite. I Like, Mac, Mac is injury-prone. Like, he, he gets injured a lot. If Mac goes down, like, their, their pass rush is going to suffer like crazy. Yeah. A couple injuries to their defense, like Mac, Eddie Jackson, 
and fucking uh, and Kyle Fuller are like, if one of those guys goes down, I expect their defense to like suffer tremendously. So I could definitely see them having like a very high pick. That's complete sidebar conversation, but yeah, I know. And before we talk about Houston, I just think it's funny. Like we talk about how bad their defense is. JJ Watt, legitimately, I feel bad for the guy because I love him. That guy gets hurt every fucking year too. So mm-hmm. that will even further help out Deshaun Watson, even though I think Allen's still going to finish over him. So you got any closing arguments here before we get out of here? No, Will Fuller could be a top 15 receiver also, just saying. yeah, no, it, it would be the most Will Fuller thing ever to just finish a year in his contract season. Like, like if he finally stays healthy for one year, but it's in his contract year, and then Bill O'Brien just, like, pays him the, like, backs up the Brinks truck for him, that'd be funny as hell. Yeah, no, the, the guy's going to fucking slip in the shower week 10 and be done out for the season, so. <laughs> Tear his uh, ACL bringing in the groceries. Yeah, something fucking stupid. So you can uh, shout out yourself now here before we get out of here. Yeah, um, uh, as Nick said, my Twitter is probably on the screen or linked down, down below. Make sure you guys are following along. I always, when I'm doing research for stuff, I always tweet out like interesting things that I see. So um, I, I always, that's what I use Twitter for personally. I always like go on Twitter and see people tweeting out stats from when they're researching. So make sure you're following along there. Make sure you go subscribe to our YouTube. We always have um, uh, pretty much similar topics that Nick uh, talks about on here. So if you're interested in this kind of content, which you obviously are, if you're watching this video, make sure you go subscribe to the fantasy stock exchange on YouTube, check out the website. We're going to have a draft guide launching in July. Um, make sure you stay tuned for that. Our rankings are up on our site right now. If you want to check out that both dynasty and redraft, uh, of my personal rankings are up there. And I believe the other guys have theirs up there as well. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, so make sure to check that out. Tyler's kicker rankings are going to be great. Have a great rest yeah. of your guys' day. Check out, there's a bunch, there's going to be three videos on the screen. Click on any of those. Click the subscribe button. That's either on your screen right now or down below. Uh, we're going to become Nikki 5K soon enough. I love you all. Yeah. Have a great rest of your guys' day. Good boy.